Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the anatomy of a frontal chest x-ray. Now this is something that comes up in practice all the time. It's such a common radiograph, but also without doubt comes up in every anatomy exam. So today's focus is going to be purely on the anatomy. What can we identify in this image? It's not an approach to chest x-rays. That will come in another talk. So let's start how I like to look at a chest x-ray. First, looking at all the various contours and lines, knowing what is normal. And if you see any abnormalities there, you can then focus your search. So let's start by looking at the mediastinum. We'll start on the left-hand side of the patient and identify the borders of the mediastinum and which structures make up those borders. So let's start in the left upper zone on this radiograph and identify this first border that's coming here. This is the left subclavian artery that's coming off the arch of the aorta. So that goes without saying that this next knuckle here is the aortic knuckle or the aortic arch where that left subclavian artery is coming off. Below that we have our pulmonary trunk here and it makes this concavity here known as the AP window, the aortopulmonary window. Down from the pulmonary trunk is this section of the heart here, which is the left atrial appendage. And that left atrial appendage then extends down the left heart border as the left ventricle on that side. So let's have a look at what that looks like on our CT scan here. We can see we're at the level of the carina here. We can see the arch of the aorta. And as we scroll backwards, we can see those branches of the aorta coming off. And here is our left subclavian artery, that first contour on our chest x-ray. Then we have our aorta here, our pulmonary trunk, and this is our AP window, heading down to our left atrium with our left atrial appendage here, making up that superior lateral portion of the heart. And as we go down, our left ventricle is making up that left border of the heart. Let's go over to this right border of the heart here. Now on our chest x-ray, we can start inferiorly. This border of the heart here is our right atrium. Remember, the right ventricle is an anterior structure. We can see on our axial slices here. Here is our right ventricle making up the anterior portion of the heart. Our right atrium is this lateral right border of the heart. Then superiorly from this right atrium is our superior vena cava here coming upwards. And that then is contributed to by the left and right brachiocephalic veins. This junction here is our cavoatrial junction. This is where the tip of our central venous line should ideally end. This recess or, or junction is cavoatrial recess. So let's have a look on our coronal slices here. Here is our superior vena cava getting its tributaries from the left and right brachiocephalic veins down into that right atrium here. There's our right atrium making that right heart border. So let's move on to the lines and stripes that we can see on this frontal radiograph. Now a line is a piece of soft tissue that's surrounded by aerated lung and it's narrow. Here's an example of a line behind the trachea here. You can see the soft tissue line here. This is what's known as our posterior junctional line. That's where our left and right lungs, the visceral and parietal pleura, abut from the left and right hand side behind the esophagus. So posterior junctional line there. We also have an anterior junctional line here. This is below the manubrium, anterior to the heart. And I'll show you where these lines come from on a axial CT slice here. So let's head upwards. We're at the level of the great vessels. Anteriorly, you can see where the left and the right lungs abut. There's four layers of pleura here, and they create this line, the anterior junctional line. Posteriorly and more superiorly will be our posterior junctional line here. This is that soft tissue behind the esophagus, behind the trachea, and it's variably thick in patients and variably long from anterior to posterior in patients. This is what makes our posterior junctional line that we've seen on our x-ray. Now you don't always see this on an x-ray, but if you see it, you know what it is. We then have the arch of our aorta here, which we identified earlier, coming down into the descending aorta. That's the descending aorta heading all the way down. We should be able to follow that line all the way down. We've mentioned our AP window here. That's another line I like to look at. We can also see, if we look closely, this line coming just lateral to our anterior junctional line, coming down like that. That's what's known as our azygoesophageal recess or our azygoesophageal line there. This is posterior where the azygous vein and the esophagus run on this posterior surface of the thorax here. We can see the azygous vein here as we scroll down 
this line here. You see how there's recess here, all aerated lung creating this line along the anterior aspect of our vertebra here, heading slightly to the left hand side of the patient as we head down. So if you see loss of this recess here and there's a mass here, you can predict that that mass is posterior in that azygoesophageal recess. We also have what's known as stripes. Those are lines, but thicker. So we've also got aeration on both sides. We've got lucency on both sides of a stripe. A good example of that is our left paratracheal stripe here. You can see this dense region here, lateral to our trachea, and our right paratracheal stripe here, where our great vessels are coming off from our brachiocephalic artery or from the arch of the aorta heading up our uh, common carotid arteries heading up through there, some soft tissue. And if we get widening of those lines, we can think of tumors like a pancos tumor on this side or enlarged lymph nodes. So it's really important to look at those stripes there. Other lines that we can identify are our paravertebral lines. Here's our right paravertebral line going along the vertebral bodies there on the right hand side. And we have a left paravertebral line, which often then continues along with that descending aortic line. So now we've looked at the lines, the lines of the mediastinum, as well as the lines of the midline here where our pleura are abutting and our posterior and anterior junctional lines, our paravertebral and paratracheal lines and stripes respectively. We can now move our attention to the airways, to the actual respiratory system. So the airways here, I'm going to actually draw them in green. We can see our trachea coming down centrally here, right down the middle bifurcating into our right main bronchus, as well as our longer and more oblique left main bronchus heading out there. Our left main bronchus then divides into our left upper lobe bronchus and our left lower lobe bronchus on that side. The right hand side divides into our right upper lobe bronchus here and then our bronchus intermedius on this right hand side, which then will divide into our right middle and right lower lobe bronchi. Those are the major bronchi that we can see here. We can, if we look closely, see these endon apical segments here of the superior lobes. And if you want to get more detail about the bronchopulmonary tree, I've got a full video looking at the CT scan of the bronchopulmonary tree and the various different segments of the tree. Now we can actually look on our CT scan here, follow this bronchopulmonary tree, our trachea coming down centrally, going into our right main bronchus, our longer left main bronchus. You can see if you aspirate standing upwise, gravity dependent, you're much more likely to aspirate into this right hand side with this more vertically orientated bronchus intermedius here. You can see our right upper lobe bronchus, our bronchus intermedius here, bifurcating into our middle and lower lobe bronchi. On the left hand side, here's our left upper lobe bronchus going down into our left lower lobe bronchus on that side. And if we were to scroll more anteriorly, we would see those end on apical segments. See that there, we're cutting these lower order bronchi, the anterior segments of the apical lung here, and those are the ones that we can see end on on our radiograph here. Now that we've looked at the airways, it's a good way now to move on to the hyla. And I know people really struggle with the hyla, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time here showing you how you can identify the main structures that make up both the right and the left hyla. Now, in order to understand the hyla, what you really need to understand is the path of the pulmonary arteries. So I'm going to go to this axial slide and show you how the pulmonary arteries run in relation to the bronchi. So let's go up to the superior aspect of the heart here. We can see our ascending aorta here, our descending aorta here. See how the aortic arch comes round, ascending, descending. Here's our pulmonary trunk that we've identified on this frontal radiograph. And that pulmonary trunk separates into our right pulmonary artery and our left pulmonary artery. Now our right pulmonary artery comes anterior to this right main bronchus, posterior to the superior vena cava, coming in front of that right main bronchus. So let's draw it in here. Here's our pulmonary trunk. And it extends on the right hand side anterior to this right main bronchus. Now that pulmonary artery will separate into two branches. It's got a truncus anterior, which heads medial to our right upper lobe bronchus, and it's got a right interlobar artery, this large artery that we can see extending down here, this dense structure going lateral to our bronchus intermedius. That is our 
interlobar artery of our right pulmonary artery. So let's find that vessel here. As we scroll down, we should see our right pulmonary artery separating into our interlobar artery. I'll show you, it might be better on this coronal side. Watch our pulmonary trunk here separate into our right pulmonary artery coming in front of that right main bronchus and giving off a superior branch, our truncus anterior, and an inferior branch here, which has our right bronchus intermediate. This makes up that inferior limb of our hilum, which I'll show you now. And you can see why it's so obvious on the chest x-ray, because we've got a hollow structure medially and loosened lung laterally. And we can see this density here, our right interlobar artery. On that side, making up the superior limb of the hilum is our superior pulmonary vein coming in this way. Our superior pulmonary vein comes posterior to these structures and drains into our left atrium here. Our left atrium is a posterior structure. This superior pulmonary vein drains behind these structures into our left atrium. You'll see here that the superior limb here makes up the superior angle of our hilum and this interlobar artery makes up the inferior limb of our hilum. This angle here is our hilar angle on the right. So let's have a look at those structures here. We can see our right interlobar artery laterally to that right upper lobe bronchus. We can see this structure here, this structure here, follow it down. There it is there running behind our right interlobar artery, following down into the confluence here and into our left atrium posteriorly here. Follow that artery there coming around the back. That's making up this angle on our right hilum. Let's move on to the left hilum. Now you can see our pulmonary trunk coming here, but then behind that, this large vessel coming out. You see it there. Now you can see that this large vessel is actually our left pulmonary artery. Our left pulmonary artery comes off the pulmonary trunk and wraps over and around this left main bronchus. You see how it wraps over and around posteriorly behind that left main bronchus. It's easier to see on the axial slices here. Let me head up onto the mediastinal views. Here's our left pulmonary artery wrapping over and around this left main bronchus. You see how it jumps over the back and runs down, it jumps over the back of that left main bronchus there. So we can see that that left pulmonary artery has actually gone over this left main bronchus, and then it gives off two branches. Behind this left upper lobe bronchus, it gives off our left interlobar artery that we can see here, which makes up the inferior limb of our hilum, and it gives off these variable superior lobe branches to the upper lobe of the lung. And this anatomy here is variable, and we don't have such a nice hilar angle like we can see on the right but we can appreciate the angle that is formed here between our left interlobar artery and these superior branches to our left upper lobe. We also, on that side, have some density here that is a result of the left superior pulmonary vein that's also draining towards this left atrium behind the heart here. Now let's have a look on this side. We can see our left pulmonary artery jumps over that left main bronchus, and gives off this left interlobar artery here. And we don't see it too well in the coronal sections here, but there are some branches that head upwards, the apical or superior branches of that left pulmonary artery, as well as the superior pulmonary veins that are coming back into this left atrium. We can see those superior pulmonary veins heading this way. So those are the hyla. Let's actually have a look at them without all my scribbles over it. We have our carina here of the trachea, Coming across that right main bronchus is our right pulmonary artery, giving off our right interlobar artery on this side. And our truncus anterior is making up this density on the medial aspect here, the medial aspect of this right upper lobe bronchus. We then have our right upper lobe bronchus and our superior, our right superior pulmonary vein making up that superior limb on the right side. On the left hand side, we've got this left pulmonary artery jumping over giving off a left interlobar artery and superior branches to the upper lobe of the left lung, as well as this left superior pulmonary veins draining towards the heart. So I hope that this 3D representation on our CT scan allows us to visualize the hilum a bit better on our chest radiograph. 
And if this kind of learning helps you going through 3D anatomy and then looking at a radiograph, consider subscribing to the channel and liking the video. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy this style of teaching. Now let's move on from the hyla and go to our lobes of the lungs. So we've done our bronchopulmonary tree. Now let's go out actually into the lung parenchyma. Now when we're looking at a chest radiograph, we often separate the lungs into zones, an upper zone, a middle zone, and a lower zone. But as we know, our right lung has three lobes, and our left lung has two lobes. The point I want to get across is that our lower lobes actually start all the way up here. On the right-hand side, about the level of T5. On the left-hand side, about the level of T4. Now if we look carefully on the right-hand side, we can see a horizontal fissure here, which separates the right upper lobe from the right middle lobe. And that extends anteriorly from about the fourth to sixth rib, posteriorly intersecting with the hilum on this side. And then joining that right oblique fissure that we're going to look at now. Let's go to our lateral view and see how those oblique fissures on both sides runs. If we were looking at the left lung, we have an oblique fissure that runs from the diaphragm here about three to four centimeters behind the sternum and heads up to about the level of T4. Now you can see how if you have a mass here and you were looking at a radiograph, a frontal radiograph, that mass could look like it's in the upper lobe. Then it becomes really important to look at our lines that we looked at and our mediastinal contours that we looked at and see if that silhouetting is happening with posterior structures. That separates our left upper lobe from our left lower lobe. And if this was the right hand side, our right upper lobe from our right lower lobe. The right oblique fissure actually comes from about one vertebra lower down. And then we get from the hilum extending to the fourth to sixth rib, our horizontal fissure separating our right upper lobe from our right middle lobe. So you can see how our left and right lower lobes start really high up. And when we look at a frontal radiograph, all the way up here could be in the lower lobes. And you'll see that when we get a left upper lobe collapse, that left lower lobe hyper expands and we get this lucency around the aorta, a lufsicle sign. And that's an example of just how high up this left lower lobe comes. Let's move on to the diaphragms now. We've got our right and our left diaphragms on both sides here. Our right diaphragm is generally higher than our left diaphragm with the liver underneath it. We've got a, both a right cardiophrenic angle and a left cardiophrenic angle, as well as lateral costophrenic angles here between the diaphragm and the chest wall. Sometimes you can't really see here, there's a stomach bubble on the left. Normally you can see rugae in that stomach bubble. Sometimes difficult to tell whether it's stomach or intestine. We mustn't have any of that stomach bubble coming above the diaphragm. And obviously we don't want to see free air under the diaphragm, or at least we need to have a reason for why there would be free air above the diaphragm. On the lateral view, we can see our diaphragms here. Sometimes it's quite difficult to differentiate left and right diaphragms, and you can't just trust which one's higher because of the angle that that x-ray is coming in. There are a couple of ways to know which is the left and which is the right. So the easiest way to tell the difference is to see which diaphragm ends at the heart and doesn't continue forward. Our left diaphragm generally abuts the heart and we lose its contour anteriorly. So we can see that this is our left diaphragm. Our right diaphragm generally extends all the way to that anterior wall and then heads its way back like that. If this is a left lateral projection like standard, then our right diaphragm will actually head all the way out to this larger set of ribs on the outside. We can see how these ribs end here and these ribs end here. That's because our x-ray beam diverges and as we hit our right ribs on this side, they cast a larger shadow, there's more magnification. So our right ribs are further out than our left ribs. That's another way of telling the right diaphragm from the left. Now there are three holes within this diaphragm, one posteriorly here, which is our aortic opening of the diaphragm, our esophageal opening of the diaphragm, and our vena cava opening of the diaphragm. Here, our inferior vena cava comes through here, as well as branches of our right phrenic nerve, and that's at about the level of T8. Then our esophageal opening has the esophagus, it's at the level of T10, and our vagus nerve coming through there. And our aortic opening obviously has the aorta it's at the level of T12, as well as the thoracic duct and the azygous vein. It's a common question in exams, which level these openings occur at the diaphragm and which structures pass through those openings. 
Moving on to the pleura, well, there's not much to see on a normal chest x-ray when you're looking at pleura, but you want to follow the pleura all the way around on the lateral aspects of these radiographs. Again, if there's a pleural effusion, you can get blunting of this costophrenic angle, which is actually much more sensitive on our lateral view here, gravity dependent, this is the lowest part of the lung. We need much less fluid here to get blunting of that posterior costophrenic angle. But we can get blunting of these lateral costophrenic angles in a pleural effusion. You can also see pleural thickening when we get pleural plaques or pleural, pleural mets. And you mustn't get confused when you see a thickening like this here, that's actually that medial border of our scapula. So you want to be careful that you actually are call, calling a pleural thickening. And obviously, if there's air in between the visceral and parietal pleuras, we can identify a pneumothorax, which is most common on these apical views if the patient is upright. Moving on to the bones, there's not just the ribs to look at. We need to understand that there's shoulders, clavicles, spine as well. So let's identify some of those bones that start at the vertebral column. We can see our transverse processes here of T1. They angle superiorly like that. Our spinous process here. We can see our pedicles, those are the bones running from our vertebral bodies heading out towards the lamina and then to the spinous processes. You can see there our vertebral bodies, it's good to look at all the vertebral bodies, our intervertebral disc on that side, our clavicle here, our sternoclavicular joint, follow that clavicle all the way out to the shoulder. You can see that we've actually collimated those shoulders off here, but if you could see the shoulders, you want to look at the humeral head, the glenohumeral joint, the humeral shaft itself. You can see our coracoid process, our spinous process or our spine of our scapula. Here's our medial border, our tip and our lateral border of the scapula there. And then obviously looking at the ribs themselves. We can follow from the posterior. Here is our first rib heading round there. We can follow the posterior portion of the second rib here down all the way to this anterior part of the second rib. You can look at all those anterior ribs as well as looking at the posterior ribs here. You want to follow each rib all the way around, look for notching along the ribs, look for rib fractures, especially on this lateral portion, it can be quite difficult to see rib fractures. And on the subject of things that are difficult to see, where the bones cluster up like this, like in the apices of the lungs, these are good review areas. We often miss masses or miss pneumothoraces here. We miss things behind the heart because the heart is casting a shadow. One of the most common mistakes when looking at a chest x-ray is that we look at the lungs only in the lucent field here that I'm outlining all the way along here. We forget that the lungs extend all the way around to this posterior junctional line down to the esophageal recess. They extend below the diaphragm. They go all the way around the diaphragm. Remember on that lateral how far the lungs go around. And we commonly miss consolidation or masses or pathology in this part of the lungs because we forget to look at them. They've been, a shadow has been cast over them. We still need to look at that lung tissue behind there. Now we can move on from the bones and lastly look at the soft tissues. Now I'm not going to name any soft tissue specifically other than to say you need to look at the soft tissue above the clavicles, the axilla, look for lymph nodes or masses there, especially looking at soft tissue that has bone overlying here. Remember to look at the head of the humerus on this side. I didn't mention it on the bone slide. As well as looking at the soft tissue here. This is not air between the soft tissue. This is actually a fat stripe, fat between the muscles. Don't call this as air there. That's normal. You want to get used to what the soft tissues look like and then get look good at looking at the soft tissues. Remember on a female patient, there's breast tissue anterior. Sometimes a breast mass may be mistaken as a lung mass. So really remember that there is soft tissue surrounding the thoracic cavity. And what I'd like you to get from this talk is that it's not just the lungs and the heart that we look at on a chest x-ray. There's so much anatomy that we can get from a simple chest x-ray. And if you start developing a system that you're looking for the various different bits of anatomy, the mediastinal contours, the lines and stripes, the airways, the hyla, the heart itself, the bones, the soft tissue and the pleura as well as the diaphragm and you actively look at all of those areas, you're going to pick up pathology much more often than you miss it. So I hope you've enjoyed this style of learning. Let me know if you have and until next time, I'll see you all. Goodbye.